welcome to Cornerstone. Let's all stand and join the choir on the second verse of Victory in Jesus. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing Amen. Please remain standing for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, I am saved. Keep us safe. And uh, love you and thank you for all of the things that you've done. Please help us to uh, hear the message and peace in your name. Remain standing. This will be our handshake song, page number 191. There is power in the blood. After the first chorus, we'll shake hands. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Shake hands.
we're going to sing the third verse. When you get done shaking hands, everybody return to your seat. We're going to sing on the third verse. There is power in the blood. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you are saints in his life-giving flow? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. On the fourth, would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. At, at this time, the choir singing, you may be seated. Or I thought they were. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning. Glad to see you here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. We're so happy to have you. And we have a lot to get to today, so we're going to get through it quickly as possible. Um, right there on the Welcome Center desk is we have... The new devotionals for April, May, and June, they're available and they're free of charge. We want them to be used, and so we want you to stop by there and grab them and then use them. And here's a disclaimer, a devotion is not supposed to replace what you're already supposed to be reading in God's Word. It's just a supplement. It, it has a short little story and then an explanation of the verses, and it gives you just a couple verses to read for that day. Now, I want, I want you to, to take advantage of that. They're right there on the desk, and uh, that's something that my home church landmark does for free, and I want you to get stop by there and use it today. Also, on the Welcome Center desk, we have just one week, just one week to get the word out about our resurrection Easter services next week. We're going to have a, a wonderful day. All the music and preaching and everything is going to be centered around uh, the greatest event in history. That's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we're wanting to get the word out about that, and people will come to Easter if you invite them, and they'll come to Easter. And so please get these inv invite cards out, and on the back it has a short presentation of the gospel, and those are in the track rack and also on the desk, and help me pass them out. And I need your help with this because we can't reuse these next year, right, because uh, it has the, the date of Easter on there, right? And I, want, I did that on purpose so we get, get a fire under us to get them out, and so we don't have a box full of wasted tracks. And so please grab them. What we have out there is all we have left. And so let's use them up and invite people to come to church with us next uh, service, uh, su next Sunday. Also, right after the service this morning, anyone who's signed up for the marriage retreat, I like to have just a short and uh, five minutes tops meeting where we go over the itinerary. We give those out to you and answer any questions that you have about that. Um, and so right after the service this morning, we'll be meeting in the home builders class in the first door to your left in the hallway and uh, just for five minutes as we go over the, the itinerary. Also, um, the marriage retreat is actually this Friday and Saturday. We're looking forward to it. Should be a great, great time. If you signed up, you can pay for it by just a, a check or cash and put that in the tithe envelope with your name on it marked marriage retreat. Also, the offices will be closed um, Friday, uh, actually Monday and Tuesday, uh, March 25th and 26th, and will be open Wednesday and Thursday um, of, of this upcoming week. And then, of course, we have the marriage retreat, so we'll be gone on that. And so if you, if you need us, please, you got our cell phone numbers, call us, text us, and uh, we'll answer any questions that you have. Um, also, for the next Sunday night service, for Easter service, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper during the Sunday night service. And so that'll be a wonderful time as a church family where we observe the Lord's Supper together. And um, I'm looking forward to April. April's our missions month. We're doing things a little bit different this year to get more speakers in, to get a little bit more of a, a presentation of different missionaries this year. 
we're going to have every Sunday of the month of April, we're going to have a missionary present their work and uh, also bring the message as well. And so we're looking forward to it. We have um, the, the Saunders family with us April 7th. He is a church planner. Um, and then the next Sunday, we have Mike Mullins. He's somebody I know dearly. Uh, he's a missionary to Santiago, Chile. And then we have uh, many other ones that month. And so please be in prayer for Missions Month. And please be in prayer. The Lord gives us a, a sense of direction of who to take on for support. And uh, we're looking at meeting our budget. Uh, our goal this year was 120000 And as of last week, we're already up at 119000 And so we still have six weeks to go. And so uh, that does not mean we stop giving toward it. Uh, it would be wonderful to surpass it and then be an extra blessing to our missionaries and, and uh, give that money to some of their needs that they have. And so uh, please be in prayer as you give towards our missions this, this year. And then we are blessed to have, we're blessed to have the Lamont family with us uh, with Bible Literature Missionary Foundation. And uh, he is, he's recently taken over officially from his father who retired. And did you tell me it's fourth generation? He is the third generation of Lamonts who've run the ministry, and so we're, it's just a blessing to have him with us. And he'll be he'll be showing a, a video, a presentation of his ministry, and then he'll preach right afterward. Looking forward to it. And then right before he preaches, we'll have the video, and then his wife, uh, Miss Tiffany, will come and she'll sing. And then brother, you come on and preach to us. And looking forward to it. Uh, we'll have the prayer for the offering, but before we do that, there are several folks we need to pray for. Um, pray for um, Elsie Perez, that is Miss Hollis is, is your aunt, Miss Hollis's aunt, and she's not doing well. So pray for um, Elsie Perez, and then also pray for Mrs. Ledbetter's brother, David Butler. No, is it your brother? Brother David uh, Butler, um, who's uh, having surgery tomorrow. And so pray for David Butler's surgery, and we have a lot of people out sick. It's a lot of people out sick today. Um, pray for baby Sam, who's got the, the, the bug and so many other people who are dealing with sickness. Um, continue to pray for those who've lost loved ones. Pray for Brian Burhan. Uh, with, uh, he has ALS. That's a buddy of Austin Cook. And uh, he's getting worse. And uh, is getting worse and just not doing well. So pray for Brian. And then um, pray for the Anderson's friend, Jim Gates, who's uh, having surgery April 14th. And then has a surgery a week later to remove uh, some cancer on his nose. And so many people on our prayer list. We'll keep these in prayer. And then uh, we'll pray for the offering. If you're visiting with us, we're so happy to have you. And uh, we're, we're blessed to you, for you to be our visitor this morning. So let's pray for the offering. And then we'll continue with the service. And God's good, isn't he? All right. It's your time to get back to him. Uh, he certainly is worthy of it. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, again, God is good. So let's, let's, let's pray. Father, we are so thankful. Uh, everything that you do in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, um, you have truly blessed this church uh, simply because you are faithful. And, uh, and we, we love you and, and praise you for all that you've done. And uh, by our way of being faithful back to you is giving back to you. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you bless the giver. Uh, watch over their heart and minds and and those that haven't experienced that uh, uh, that giving yet, Lord, I pray that you just help their hearts this morning, help them to understand, man, giving to God is just the best thing you can do other than your lives. And uh, we just thank you for all that you've done again, and we pray that you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you for that song. That was great. Let's all stand. We're going to sing at Calvary. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurn. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary on the last oh the love that drew salvation's plan oh the grace that brought it down to man oh the mighty God that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Thank you. You may be seated. Hello, my name is Mark Smith, and I'm the president of the board of directors for the Bible and Literature Missionary Foundation here in Shelbyville, Tennessee. It's my privilege as a pastor, a serving pastor from Faith Baptist Church in Tacoma, Washington, to work alongside of this ministry in the distribution of Bibles. This ministry is well known around the world, and especially to missionaries on the foreign field, for producing the precious Word of God and distributing it worldwide. My family, we've been missionaries in the country of Croatia for 21 years now. The greatest need that we had was a Bible. It's hard to have a church if you don't have a good Bible. The Bibles we had were uh, perversions, if you will. And God put it on my heart to translate the Word of God into the Croatian language. And after 12 years of labor, uh, myself, a national pastor, another missionary, made that happen and became a reality. But we had a problem. We had it translated. But what were we to do then? Wasn't going to hand write it and give it to him. And so I remembered when I was back in Bible college, Brother Lamont Sr. came by our college. I remember him looking at the students and said, if you ever need a Bible, you call me. And I called the number, looked it up on the internet and called it. And Dr. Bobby Lamont answered the phone and I told him the story about his dad and what happened in Bible college. And immediately he said, we'll print your Bible for you. Won't cost you a thing. Bible Literature Missionary Foundation sent us 10,000 Bibles. I cannot tell you the joy of our people when I opened the first box of those New Testaments 
And I began to pass them out to our people. Brother Lamont has agreed they're going to send another container to us very soon. It'll be the third container of Bibles. Cost us nothing. I'll be honest with you. Bible Literature Missionary Foundation, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets in our country. A ministry that prints Bibles and sends them all over the world for missionaries all over the place, free of charge. And I've been on this end of seeing Bibles loaded onto a trailer, and I've watched them get unloaded and watched people just so excited to get their hands on their very own copy of the Word of God. To me, you ought to be a part of it. I just No matter who you are, even if you're not a pastor, it, make it part of your budget to be a part of a ministry that is doing everything they can. The faith aspect of this ministry, to me personally, is the most challenging, motivational, and inspiring part. To see their leadership just so for getting the gospel out, whatever it takes, stepping up by faith and trusting the Lord, and seeing God provide miracle after miracle. The Lord saved me in 1973, he called me to preach in 74, and I pastored 17 years, and God called me into missions. And as a pastor, I supported printed ministries, and when I went out into missions, and then I began to realize a, a greater importance uh, in, in the investment and then the involvement of uh, printing and uh, getting the word of God to the mission field. I can remember going into Kenya for the first time. And then I remember the second time, the third time, the Lord really did something in my life that uh, changed me that day. And what happened is there was about probably 1,800 people there. And I asked the people there, I said, how many of you have a copy of the word of God? And only 100 people raised their hand. It broke my heart. I began to weep to see all those people there. 1,700 of them did not have a copy of the Word of God. I had no idea where to get Bibles from. I, hadn't, I, I didn't know whom to call. And we began to pray. And then six months later, through Bible Literature Missionary Foundation, they gave us 42,000 King James Bibles, Old Testament, New Testament, and we shipped them there to Kenya. And when I got there the next time, we passed out Bibles. I saw mothers and daddies with tears running down their faces and thanking God for a copy of the Word of God. And through Bible and Tear Missionary Foundation, we have sent nine containers to date. A vision for this ministry was given to Dr. Bob Lamont Sr. during World War II as he served as a chaplain's assistant after being injured on the front lines. Traveling around the European battlefields, Brother Lamont noticed none of the people had a copy of the Word of God. He brought that burden back to the States, and in 1968, with the help of his son, Bobby Lamont Jr., started the Bible and Literature Missionary Foundation out of the Hemp Hill Baptist Church, where he pastored in Fort Worth, Texas. In 1972, the ministry moved to Shelbyville, Tennessee, under the leadership of the Victory Baptist Church. BLMF continues to grow and produce more scriptures than ever. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Warren, pastor at Victory Baptist Church, and I have the honor of being part of the home church that the Bible and Literature Missionary Foundation is based out of. I've had the privilege of working with the Bible and Literature for over 30 years of my own life, and now as a pastor of Victory Baptist Church, I'm able to tell you that you can find no greater ministry to be a part of. I know for a fact this is a ministry that loves the Lord, a ministry built on integrity, and a ministry built on faith. And so I encourage you to do all you can to help this ministry because what you give to them will be used greatly in the work of God. Hello, I'm Shannon Lamont, the Assistant Director with the Bible and Literature Missionary Foundation. Any given day we have several different languages going. We've got English on the web press, Urdu Bibles on the collating tables, and we have Arabic Bibles on the binder. I get phone calls daily from missionaries saying, how can I get a container of scriptures? How can we get the word of God to our people? 
A container will hold 30,000 whole Bibles or 65 to 75,000 New Testaments or 350,000 John and Romans. A roll of paper costs us approximately $1,000 and that will produce 500 whole Bibles or 2,000 New Testaments or 10,000 John and Romans. At our current rate of production, we need to raise finances for seven trailer loads of paper per month. Scripture says the Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it. But I love the verse that says in Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. My friend, the word of God is the only way that they'll know about Jesus Christ. You know, we can't do anything apart from this precious book. I couldn't be saved. There wouldn't be a church. We'd have no message to preach. To me, if you're saved, if you have a pulse, if you love the Lord, if you love our perfectly preserved, inspired King James Bible, then get a part of this ministry and do your best to support it. Please consider taking them on for support. They are so worthy to the missionary. It costs us absolutely nothing on the mission field to receive Bibles. This is a ministry. It's not a business. It is a ministry for missionaries. This ministry needs your financial commitment. And what a ministry it is. Thank God for Bible Literature Missionary Foundation that prints the Word of God, helps missionaries, gets the Word of God to the foreign fields. We are in over 125 countries. It is actually a miracle working ministry. Our production has never been sufficient to meet the needs, to meet the requests that we get. So my friend, will you help us? If you love this precious book, that you wouldn't want to do something to help to get it to those that do not have it. Have you ever felt the warmth of the sun after another long night was done and you open your eyes to a brand new sunrise? God's faithfulness was there again, new mercies and new compassion. When you lost all hope, he never left you alone, he's good like that there's never a moment he doesn't know exactly where you're at no matter the sorrow he'll be in your tomorrow that's a fact he's good like that Have you ever felt so unworthy of all the blessings, so undeserving? You don't understand why God would be so kind. He's bottled every tear you've shed, numbered every hair on your head. Hasn't he always proved he would take care of you? He's good like that there's never a moment he doesn't know exactly where you're at no matter the sorrow he'll be in your tomorrow that's a fact he's good like that he holds the world in place he reaches 
reaches down in grace. He knows you by name. He's good like that. There's never a moment he doesn't know exactly where you're at. No matter the sorrow, he'll be in your tomorrow. That's a fact. He's good like that. He's so good. God is so good. No matter the sorrow, He'll be in your tomorrow, that's a fact. He's good like that. He's good like that. He's good like that. My family is going to pass out a New Testament that I want to do an illustration uh, real quickly. But uh, the Bible and Literature Missionary Foundation is uh, in existence just to print the Word of God and to give it to your missionary free of charge. You cannot do the work of God without the Word of God. So last year we were able to produce just a little of around 2.4 million copies of the Word of God. And we were able to ship 28 containers out of Shelbyville, Tennessee. I encourage you, if you're ever able to make it to Shelbyville, Tennessee, we're just a little less than six hours from you, I encourage you, please come see us. Because the eye affects the heart. There is nothing like seeing the presses running paper through the presses, coming out 48 pages of the Word of God or 64 pages of the Word of God, and seeing your fingerprints put on the pages of the Word of God, building a Bible, then watching that Bible go through that binder, coming out trimmed and ready to go to the foreign field, I promise you, it'll change your life forever. Because I'm telling you, we ought to have a love and a desire for the Word of God so much that we would want the entire world to get a copy of the Word of God. So this year, we've got an amazing goal. We printed, uh, we've gotten, uh, I think, 166. No, it would have, we just sent out that container. So we've got 200,000. We've already shipped out two containers, one to the Philippines and one to El Salvador. Uh, look at my wife. Sometimes she helps me remember these things. And we've got, right now on my desk, I've got 29 more container requests of missionaries and when we send out a container, we're looking at 30,000 whole Bibles, or if we mix them, somewhere between 30,000 and 100,000 scriptures. So can you imagine what that would do on the foreign field? My Bible says, "Where entrance of thy light giveth understanding to the simple. If we can just get people the word of God, they'll come to the saving knowledge of Christ. My family passed out some New Testaments. I want to do an illustration real quickly. So if you received a New Testament from uh, my family, not if you own one, but if you received one, would you please stand up? Because what I want to do real quickly is I want you to see the urgency and the importance. Because if I could bar your minds for just a second, if this room right here could represent the 8 billion people that live on this planet, what you are looking at is the ratio of the people that have the Word of God in their language. That's it. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm an equal opportunity disruptor. So if you did not receive a New Testament, would you please stand up? What you're doing right here is if you're standing up, can I ask you to do me a favor? Take my Bible and open to John 3.16 and read a verse. Is 
there's nothing? What do you mean there's nothing? It says Holy Bible, King James. Would you open that and go to Ephesians 5, 8 or... Seventy percent of the world's population. That's exactly what they have. Absolutely nothing. So if you're standing up, you're still waiting on the people that are sitting down to get you the word of God. Whose responsibility is it? Who's going to do it? History would tell you that it's always been the church's responsibility to print the word of God. The church is the custodian of the word of God. So if you're sitting down, you were just randomly given a copy of the word of God. But if you're standing up, you're still waiting on the world to give you the church to give you the word of God. Thank you. You may be seated. That's the ratio of people that would still be looking for the word of God if we had 8 billion people. If you do have any questions, please feel free to ask. I love answering them. There is no dumb questions. And also, my wife loves answering them too. I like it when she doesn't know and she has to come to me and ask me. But God has been good. We've been doing this for 55 years, and we have seen a tremendous outpouring of the Word of God. In 2011, we, we noticed something that we were out of room. We operated out of a, a building that was 10,000 square foot, and we noticed that if we were ever going to grow, we, we, we set out on a project to uh, honor our King James Bible. We wanted to do 400,000 King James Bible in 2011. And God blessed, and we did 422,000. But in 10,000 square foot, we had to move things outside to run the equipment so that when, if we pray it didn't rain or, or you know, something while well, we were able to run the binder and all that stuff. And we started asking God to do something and what he would have us to do and in 2014, we got a phone call from a businessman. A businessman asked for a routing number and our account number. And after Christmas, <coughs> we looked in there and he had wired $500,000 into our account. And that's what God used to give us that beautiful building that you saw on that video. From there, he was able to allow us to triple our production. So we went from about a 1 million to a 2.5 million production. Then we started realizing with the new facilities and the requests that we needed to do something. And uh, about two years ago, God gave us a beautiful new web press. Not new to us, it was used, but he gave it to us. So now we're running two web presses. And now we've got the capabilities of going from 2.5 to almost 7 million copies of the Word of God. So I'm excited about what I, I believe the Lord's going to do. The DVD did say that a roll of paper costs $1,000, and that roll of paper allows us to print 500 whole Bibles. That's just for the paper. There is glue and ink. So we are asking the ministry and uh, some of our friends are asking people uh, if we can find 3,000 people in our local churches that would pray about buying one roll of paper a year. We can print off of both of those presses five days a week. The requests are there. We've got more requests than we can meet. But what we need is people, God's people, to say, hey, I'll buy one roll of paper. We need 3,000 rolls a year to keep both of those presses running. So I'm looking forward to it. This ministry over the inflation has accrued just a little bit of debt. Please pray with me over that. We owe $50,000 in debt from overages of paper and different stuff due to inflation. But uh, we've about got all that paid off, so we're praying the Lord to give us $50,000 so we can be out of, completely out of debt and we can see what God's going to do in this upcoming year with 29 more container requests. And I am looking forward to it. So thank you so much for being part of it. Thank you for allowing us to come. And I hope you see 
what everybody else sees. The printed word of God is the only way that people can come to the saving knowledge of Christ. My Bible says something in Isaiah 55, 11. I'm going to read it real quickly, and I'm going to share some stories about the ministry. But how many of you like a good joke? I like a good joke. It kind of helps me settle into the pulpit, too. If you laugh, it helps me settle. If you look at me funny, it helps me get a little more nervous. So in Isaiah 55, 11, you'll see something amazing. You'll see a promise of God. But the joke is this. How many of you have ever heard about Clarence and John? John and Clarence, they lived across the river from each other, and every time that they would see each other, that they would get out there in their front yard, and they would throw rocks hoping to hit the other, and they would just scream and do all kinds of craziness, and they just hated and couldn't stand each other. One day, the engineering committee came across uh, their, their area, and they said, hey, we're going to build a bridge that connects y'all's property. Uh, we're going to build a road there. And uh, so uh, they paid everybody what they needed to pay, and they built a bridge. And when it got done, old John walked into his uh, house, and he told his wife, he said, honey, this is it. I finally got a way to get him. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to get him what for. So his wife, being the godly lady that she is, like mine, looked at him and said, Honey, dinner will be ready in an hour. Uh, Don't be long. So old John started across that bridge, and he was going to just let Clarence know what for. All of a sudden, he gets about two-thirds of the way over there, turns around, and comes home. And his wife looked at him and said, Well, that didn't take long. And he said, Well, obviously Clarence is a looks a little smaller on this side of the, of the river. I said, I get over there and I see a sign that says, Clarence, eight foot, three inches. So I turned around and came home. Come on, you can laugh. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish it which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing wherein to I sent it. How many of you love guarantees from the Word of God? How many of you love promises from God? Man, I love promises because He shall not fail. You know, you understand the beautiful thing about God telling said, hey, you give me 10%, I'll give you 90, and I'll bless you. If you don't give your 10%, I'll curse you. You understand that. Most of everybody in here has probably guaranteed or or put that promise to the trial and you notice that when you're tithing and when you're giving your tithes and offerings God's blessing you but when you're not you can see there's just something that just don't feel right something that don't is kosher with you it's like hey I got to get back to the tithing I mean I've talked to a lot of people about how they can just say testify about the goodness of God when you're just doing what God tells you to do Number two, you'll see that he says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. I don't know about y'all, but when COVID-19 hit, every, the entire world shut down. I lost five months of meetings just like that. I remember sitting in my pajamas, drinking my coffee, and I told the first week I looked at my wife and I said, now this is fun. I didn't have to get dressed. I walked up to the TV, turned it on, watched my pastor preach with my coffee in hand. Second week, I said, there's just something that ain't right. It don't feel as fun. Never got to do it before. I remember I had a meeting in Texas that I had a couple weeks of meetings in Texas and a pastor called me and he said, Brother Lamont, I want to get things back to normal. Will you still come? I said, I'm on my way. I remember them opening up their stone books, tears in my eyes, saying, man, I've missed this. My dad made a statement a couple years ago. He said, going to church online is like kissing your wife over the phone. All you get is the smack and none of the sugar. (laughs) I said, there's a lot of truth to that. The Bible says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. Why? Because he'll bless you when you come to the house of God. There's blessings and there's energies, there's fellowship. You know, I mean, there's just something that you can't get 
when you're not in the house of God that you can get when you're in the house of God. Then he gets to Isaiah 55, 11, and he says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not prosper in the thing wherein to I sin it. He's telling you right there. He says, wherever I send it, it will re- produce results. When I realized that, I said, there's got to be something about the Word of God. There's got to be something more. Because America, it's the best kept secret. It's the, it's the nightstand decoration. It's the coffee table ornament. I mean, it's all those things, but there's so much more than, the, than it is just the Word of God. The Lord allowed me to see some things. I asked him, I said, Lord, what ministry is the Word of God? What part does it play? First and foremost, you'll see the ministry of the Word of God is, and first, foremost, salvation. My Bible in Romans 10, 17 says, So then cometh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You can't get saved outside of the Word of God. I love the fact that at the age of 12, my mom opened up the Word of God and she showed me I was lost before I got found. And as a result of what thus saith the Lord, I asked Christ into my life. I remember shortly after I surrendered my life to Christ, I was uh, invited to a a revival service and my wife said, uh, my wife, the pastor called and said, hey, can your wife sing for us our special music? I said, sure. We were there. She sang a couple songs. The evangelist got up, preached seven opportunities. Judas had to be saved. I thought it was a great message. A young lady I've known all my life walked forward and got saved. About midnight, I'm sitting, I'm I'm sound asleep, and all of a sudden my wife hits me and says, Shannon, wake up. I go, what is wrong with you? She says, I don't think I'm saved. I said, what made you think you were saved? We had already had this conversation, so we weren't unequally yoked on purpose. She says, I was seven years old, and an evangelist preached on hell, and I just knew I didn't want to go there. So I remember going to the altar at our church, and an altar worker met her and said, Dear God, Tiffany's come to receive you. Please receive her in Jesus' name. Amen. Signed a card and sent her back to her seat. Not one time showed her that she was a sinner and she was lost. She just knew she didn't want to go to hell. I prayed for a second. I said, Lord, if you're doing something in my wife's life, I don't want to interrupt. I said, give me some wisdom. Give me something to say. And the only verse that the Lord laid on my heart was Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I gave her that verse in what I thought was 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, She said it was only 20 seconds. She got up off her bed, and she got on her face and begged God to save her. That's it. For the first time, I see my sin and my need of a Savior. You see the ministry of the Word of God. You see it in salvation. Number two, you'll see the amazing ministry of the Word of God in growth. My Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that they may grow thereby. How sad is it that we choose to neglect the Word of God and neglect to grow every day of our life because we choose to neglect the Word of God. But these people in the third world countries are willing to die for it. I get letters daily that says, please send us the Word of God. We want it. But Americans, we neglect it so easily. The reason I say that is they say that the statistics is that America, less than 54% of the church reads their Bibles every day. I think it's a whole lot less than that, to be honest with you. They didn't poll me, and they probably didn't poll you, but they're using everybody in all our churches. But if you go to church, you ought to read the Word of God. You ought to be able to want to grow. You ought to have that desire as a Christian, that Holy Spirit inside you saying, hey, pick up my precious word. I want something. I want to tell you something. I want to show you something. I want you to grow in me. I want you to be closer to me. The Bible says in James, it says, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto you. We ought to have that desire to grow. I was blessed not too long ago to send a container to Mexico, to, to Africa, 
and uh Pat, the missionary called me and he said, Brother Lamont, I need uh, 10,000 Bibles. I've got some personal effects going. And I, I said, sure. I said, I've got 10,000 Bibles. I'll be glad to give you. And uh, so I gave them to him. He calls me and says he got them over there. And he starts telling me, he said, I'm going to go door knocking in this village and get acquainted with people, witness, win people to cry. He said, I'm going to start a church in this village six months after the time I get there. The way he explained it, I said, well, that's a great idea. So he started door knocking and winning people to Christ. And he says, after one week of witnessing, he said, I had three witches come to my front yard, la- yard and they started hooting and hollering, chanting and doing all kinds of uh, stuff. And he said, but I knew that greater was he that was in me than he that was in the Lord. He said, I did not panic, nor did I care. I'd get up the next day and I'd go soul winning. I'd win people to Christ. Oh, every time I'd talk to somebody, I'd tell them about we're starting a church, and I'd give them the date. He said we would go through that six months. He said they probably came to my yard probably five or six times, and he said uh, we got one week between starting a church, and he said all of a sudden they came and started hooting and hollering. He said, I did what I normally did. I didn't worry about it. I didn't want to go out there and cause any problem. But he said, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said, you do know nobody's going to come if this is going on, right? He said, without thinking, he said, he gets up and runs out the front door, starts talking and preaching to them as they're hooting and hollering. He said, one of the ladies stopped and said, what do you believe in life after death? He says, I'm glad you asked and started preaching to her about life after death. He says, I did not win her to Christ, but he says, I did give her one of your black vinyl Bibles. He says, two weeks goes by, and he said, we started the church. We had a little over 40 in attendance. He says, I thought there would be more, but because of the circumstances, he said, I, I, I see why they didn't come. And he said, but I had 42 started the church. He said, the very next week, I had a man walk in and said, are you the pastor? I said, I am. He says, My mom just died, and I need somebody to preach the funeral. He says, after talking to him, he says, I realized that she was one of the three witches. But he says, I did not know which one. He says, I got up, preached the salvation message. A few people came, uh, got saved at that funeral. He says, afterwards, the son that asked me said, hey, it's customary to go to my uh, mom's uh, house, that little hut there. And he said, we want a fellowship. And he said, would you come? And he said, I agreed. He said, I was there, and I was standing outside her little house there. And I I look inside on that dirt floor and that mat. And by there, she had a makeshift nightstand, had that black vinyl Bible I gave her. And I just walked in and opened it up. In the white pages of it, it says, Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. Please receive me as your daughter in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, I hear stories like that all the time, and you'll see the amazing ministry of the Word of God in salvation. You'll see the amazing ministry of the Word of God in growth. Thirdly, you'll see the amazing ministry of the Word of God in edification. How many of you like to feel good when you come to the house of God. You know, I do love it when the pastor preaches on something that I'm doing. I mean, I am excited. I am thrilled. I'm edified. But there's an every now and then he needs to preach on something that I'm not doing. And I mean, it hurts. If it hurt every time I come to the house of God, it probably wouldn't be fun to come to the house of God. But when the man of God gets up and preaches the word of God, you can't really argue about what he's preaching. It's just a matter of what you need to get right in your life. And so when he, when he gets up and he preaches, guess what he's using? He's using the word of God to edify the saints. Again, I was on the road and a, miss, a pastor called me from New York and he said, please forgive me, it's from New York. He calls me and he says, you have any Chinese Bibles? I said, I sure do. He says, would you send me one? I send him one and he calls me and he says, I just want to let you know that I got this Bible. A few months goes by. He calls me out of the blue and he says, Brother Lamont, do you remember that Chinese Bible you sent me? I said, I sure do. He said, I've got to read this letter to you. He reads this letter to me, and he says, "Uh, Dear Pastor, thank you for getting me this Bible. I just wanted to let you know that I got it into China. If you know anything about China, China is uh, open providences and a closed providences. 
They are the number one Bible producer of the world. They just don't know what Bible to produce. So with that, she let me know she lived in a closed providence of China. But what changed my life forever was she concluded that letter by saying, I also wanted to let you know that every member of my family is handwriting them their own copy of the Word of God. I got off that phone call with tears in my eyes, looked at my wife, and I said, I'm going to handwrite me a copy of the Word of God. I got to Genesis chapter 22 and said, this is ridiculous. I've got a printing press. It's not that easy. And for somebody to want the Word of God that much, that they're willing to handwrite their own copy of the Word of God. You see, number one, the amazing ministry of the Word of God. Number two, I want you to see the amazing multiplication of the Word of God. You'll see this in expansion. Every missionary that I talk to says that every copy of the Word of God reaches somewhere between 8 to 20 people's lives. You know what that tells me? That tells me the world's not unreachable, it's just unreached. At a small side, if we could just produce one billion scriptures, we should be able to reach the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somewhere between 8 to 20 people's lives. Number two, you'll see the amazing multiplication of the word of God, not as only expansion, but what about expectancy? This ministry will and never will try to replace the missionary. But we do want to give them the tools that they need to do the job that God's called them to do. You cannot do the work of God without the Word of God. But every year we have missionaries that have to come home off the foreign field for some reason or another. I had a missionary friend of Belize that went to the doctor and the doctor said, you're going to die if you stay here. He had to come home. But the Bibles we sent him are still over there doing the job that God's called him to do. I had a missionary friend to India that went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you're going to die if you stay here. He had to come home. The Bibles we sent him are still over there doing the job that God called him to do. I had a missionary friend to Sri Lanka that was over there witnessing. It's an amazing story, and all of a sudden he gets a knock on the door, and the government there and the police said, hey, we've been following you for a year. What are you doing over here? And he says, I'm here to tell your people about Jesus Christ. And he said, we know. We don't want you to do that. And he said, I came here to arrest you and throw you and your wife to jail. But since you're two kids, I don't want their responsibility. Tell you what, I'll confiscate your passport, give you 30 hours to get out of the country, and you report to the police station and we'll escort you to the airport. 30 hours, he went to the police station, they handcuffed him and his wife and escorted him and his two kids and his wife to the airport, hit deported and said, get out. The Bibles we sent him are still over there doing the job that God's called him to do. You see the amazing ministry of the Word of God and salvation, growth, edification, you see the amazing multiplication of the Word of God and expectancy, expansion. And the last thing I want you to see is the evangelistic cycle. When me and my wife started dating, we started teaching a junior church class uh, in our school church for five to eight-year-olds. My wife would get up and sing songs like, Each One, Reach One. The math makes sense. I love the idea behind it. Because if everybody in here would make it their goal in 2024 to reach one person for the Jesus Christ and bring them into the church and help them get discipled, guess what we just did going into 2025? We just doubled in size. It's easy if everybody would just do one. So we would sing songs like that, and I got this harebrained idea, and I come up with them every now and then. We just sent a container to Kenya, and I asked the missionary, I said, would this work in Kenya? He says, I don't know. What are you proposing? I said, would you challenge them when you get there and you 
preach to them, souls of people come forward and souls will get saved, ask them to sit down and ask them and say, hey, can I give you a copy of the Word of God? But this is what I would like to challenge you to do. I want you to take it home, read it, write it down, study it, memorize it. Whatever the altar worker shared with you, I want you to memorize. And when I want you to pray and ask God to give you one. And when God gives you one, I want you to turn around and give them that Bible. He said, Brother Lamont, he said, why would they give their only Bible away they just got and they wanted for years? I said, how about I give you 30,000 more in a year's period if they do it? I didn't know what I was getting into. I told you this was a harebrained idea. And all of a sudden, he's over there preaching, and he did exactly what I said. He calls me, and he said, Brother Lamont, I don't want to tell you that everybody did it because I don't know if they did. But he says it sure was fun to see the ones that did it. He says, I'll be out on one of those dirty, dusty roads, and I'll be talking to somebody, and all of a sudden I'll see somebody that was at that church service, and they'll be reading their Bible, walking down that street, and they'll see a total stranger down the road, and they'll beeline right to them, and all of a sudden they'll start pointing things in the Word of God, and then you'll see them bow their head, and all of a sudden you'll see and say, I want to give this to you. He said, I saw it about five or six times, and I couldn't take it no more. I walked over there to one that I was close to, and I said, why would you give your Bible away? Thinking for a second that he said, the crazy guy that sent us the Bibles asked us to, or, or you asked us to. He said, no, that's not what I heard. He said, I heard that 30,000 more in my country will do far greater good than me keeping my one. You see, when you give the Word of God, you give more than just the Word of God. You give hope. You give love. You give comfort. You give faith. You give meat. You give milk. How many of you know that wonderful verse in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? You not only give them salvation, you give them Jesus Christ. That's why I say this is the greatest gift that you can give anybody. And that's also the greatest gift that you have in your possession. I was given the opportunity not too long ago to be in Washington State. I got done preaching and an elderly lady comes up to me and he says, Brother Lamont, you don't understand I don't know about you, but I don't like it when somebody looks at me and says, you don't understand, after I get done preaching. Tell me that before. So I didn't know what was going on, and all of a sudden this elderly lady says, I was born in communistic Ukraine. I was the oldest of four. It was my job to take the Bible that my dad acquired, wrap it up into a, a fabric and put it inside a notched out brick in the fireplace. And it, it said for years I would get it out. I didn't have to worry about one of my sisters or my brothers getting it. It said it was mine. I was the oldest, so it was my job. So every day I'd get it out. We would read one verse or we would read one chapter. Then I would wrap it up, put it back inside that notched out brick in that fireplace. And then we would come back to the dinner table and we would talk about what we just read. Said for years, that's the way it worked until this one particular day. I just got this Bible out. I'd walk into the dinner table so we could read it. Got that knock on that door in a panic. I wrapped it up in that fabric, put it back in that notched out brick in that fireplace, lit that fire only to watch them ransacking our house. And as they're ransacking our house, I look back into that fireplace. And that fabric had fallen into that fire, and that fire was going into that Bible. I couldn't wait for them to leave. When, when they left, I ran and put that fire out, pulled that Bible out, and it was nothing but ashes. Man, I'm crying. My wife's crying. This lady telling the story is crying. And she looks at me and she says, Brother Lamont, I tell you this story to tell you this one. I remember like it was yesterday that my dad said we're moving to America. We land in Seattle, Washington, and the very first thing we do is go get us another Bible, and we enjoyed the freedom that we so longed for. We'd read it morning, noon, and night. 
I had to get a job to help dad live in America. And I said, I'd read it in the morning, I'd read it at night, and I'd go to a work that morning, uh, that next morning, and I'd r- talk to my coworkers about what I'd learned in the Word of God, thinking they were just as excited as I was. But he says, Brother Lamont, I quickly learned that Americans did not love their Bible like we loved our Bible. When she said that, it offended me. Then she explained, she says, at my work, I heard two things. My co-worker would say, that's in the Bible, like they'd never read it. Or you talk about this too much, like they don't want to hear it. When she said that, I stepped back and I said, ma'am, you're right. Up until this point, I've neglected the Word of God. I'd get up on a morning and I'd say I'd be on my way to my chair where I read my Bible and all of a sudden my phone rings and I have a problem that I have to deal with. Say I'll get it at lunch and I don't get to take a lunch. I'll say I'll get it before I go to bed and I don't get to go to bed until I'm plumb exhausted and I say I'll get it tomorrow. I said I've let 24 hours go by without reading the Word of God. I said, I wish I could argue with you, but I can't. But I said, effective immediately, you're not going to be able to say you love your Bible more than I love my Bible. Because I don't know how long I'm going to have the freedom. I'm not going to, I don't know how long I'm going to have the, the opportunity to stand behind the pulpit and preach the Word of God or, or go home as a family and open up the Word of God and read the Word of God and grow and learn and draw nigh unto Christ. I said, I don't know how long I'm going to have that. But effective immediately, I'm going to love the Word of God more than you. I'd like to just ask this in closing, and I'm done. How much do you love the Word of God? Has it become a nightstand decoration? Has it become a coffee table ornament? You know, I know people that when the pastor's coming over, they run and get their Bible and put it out so they'll make the pastor think that they're super spiritual and they've been reading it. I was at a church not too long ago, and the pastor's wife looked at me and said, Shannon, I had a thought, and I said, what's that? And she said, I believe that if every American Christian would pick up their Bibles and blow the dust off of it, that America would see the greatest dust storm it's ever seen and known to man. I said, you're absolutely right. So how much do you love the Word of God? Would you please stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? It's the only way that people can know that the Word of God is the power of God unto salvation. So I want to ask you this morning, if you've been neglecting the Word of God, Would you come ask God to give you a new zeal, a new love, a new passion, a new burden for the Word of God? This is the only book that will ever change our life if we allow it. But every day this book changes lives, this book changes families, this book changes homes, this book changes generations. But when it says in Isaiah 55, 11, my word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that we're into I sin it, we have to let it. It's not doing us any good on our coffee stand. It's not doing us any good on our nightstand. So if you've lost that love for the precious word of God, would you come and ask God to forgive you and give you a new zeal? Because it's the only thing. God's word is the only thing that will change your life.
Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to take a moment to ask you the most important question you could ever be asked in your life and that is do you know for sure personally that if you were to die today that you would go to heaven that's the most important question you could ever consider do you know for sure that you're saved and on your way to heaven and that 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 answer has nothing to do with the good that you've done uh, the life that you've lived the the good that you've done being more than the bad that you've done it's it's only truthfully answered yes I know that for sure based upon what you've done with the gospel of Jesus Christ have you received the free gift of eternal life by placing your faith and trust completely in Jesus and what he's done for you on the cross he was buried and rose again the third day that's the gospel so I wonder if there's if there's somebody here today, say Pastor Morton, he mentioned that verse in Romans chapter eight about the, the spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I'm I'm saved. I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't have that witness that's witnessing to my spirit that I belong to God. I don't know that for sure, but I want to know that for sure. I'm not Pastor Morton, I'm not willing to leave this place today without getting that settled. I may have some questions, concerns, or doubts about that, but today I want to get it settled. I want to know that I know that I know that I'm saved. So Pastor Morton, I don't know that, but I want someone to speak with me about that. I have questions about that. Would you raise your hand up? Would you say, Pastor Morton, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I want to know for sure that I'm saved. Will you pray for me? Anybody like that today? Raise your hand. I'll see it. Anybody here say, Pastor Morton, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I have questions. I have doubts, concerns. I want to be saved. Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that? All right. Then everybody else here professes to know Christ is their Savior. We've been challenged to take God's word seriously. People that are hungry and starving for the word of God. And we probably have, I probably have four or five copies on my bookshelf. We need to treasure the Word of God. See, Pastor Morton, I'm going to start him today. I'm going to spend time every single day. I'm going to spend time in the Word of God. If that's your heart's desire, would you raise your hand? Keep yourself accountable to that. See, Pastor Morton, I'm going to read, spend time in God's Word every day. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing one more song, one more verse. If the Lord's spoken in your heart about anything, maybe you've been saved but never been baptized, come forward and we'll talk to you about baptism what it means and how to do it. If you say, Pastor Morton, I've been saved, I've been baptized, I want to I wanna get plugged into a good church that I can raise my family in and grow in. Would you come forward and let's talk to you about how to join this church, be a part of it? Whatever God's leading you to do, please be obedient to do it as we sing this last verse. Just as I am and wait to rid my soul of one dark blot to It's been a good morning, and I thank you so much for being here with us at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And I'm going to ask, can I have the Lamont family, if you go back by your table, I want to, as we dismiss, if you go back and uh, see what material they have at their table, get a prayer card, and to make it a matter of serious prayer for their ministry. And um, if you're here today and you still have questions about getting baptized, about being saved, and be, being a member, 
please stop me or any one of the deacons and we'll be happy to answer those questions that you have. And uh, we're still seeing fruit from the Soul Winning Marathon. As we were following up with some of the decision cards, we got a chance to meet a friend of somebody who got saved and she got saved as well. And so pray for Michaela that she would grow in the Lord and that we get her in church and that she'd start to start to get planted in the house of God. So uh, I, wanna, I want us to do this as a church family before we dismiss. I, I really want us to do everything we can to, to buy a roll of paper. And so we've already mentioned leading up to today, if you can do something, then put that in the envelope, designate it, roll of paper, um, BLMF, Bible Literature Missionary Foundation, cost about $1,000 to buy a roll of paper. And I want us to really pray about what we can do. And then uh, as we come back tonight as a church family, um, let's, let's see what we can do to see if we can't buy at least one roll of paper for them before they leave. And the Lord will lay that on your heart. Um, come prepared tonight to give toward that. And I know my wife and I have already talked about it. We, we're already going to make plans to, to give toward that tonight. And so let's be dismissed in prayer. Lord bless you. Keep you safe. And we'll uh, see you tonight at 6 p.m. I haven't come dismissed in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the message that you heard just this morning. And Father, knowing that there are some souls out there that they have the desire of owning a copy of the scripture, Lord. And Lord, many times we neglect that time that we can spend with you. Please, Father, help us to be more thankful, Lord, that we have that freedom, Lord. And Father, please give us, Lord, the uh, willingness, Lord, to support ministries like this. Father, work in our hearts and uh, we can give cheerfully to ministries that continue spreading the gospel, Lord, and continue sending your word, Lord, that change lives, change families, improves communities, Lord. And Father, I want to ask you that you take us uh, home safely, bring us back tonight to continue, Lord, and worship in your name. In Jesus Christ's name, I ask you and thank you and praise you. Amen. Thank you.